Hello, I'm Alex Siebold, and I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about aquatic biology. So just to start off with, uh, here are some of the big topics that we're going to talk about. We're going to look into what water actually is in science, and then look at some wild wildlife, both micro and macro, and also do a fun little activity called the lard glove activity. Then we're going to look at oceanic zones, marine habitats, climate change, and the biodiversity and food webs of the ocean. All right, so to begin, we're going to look at the water cycle. So hopefully you guys are kind of familiar with this kind of thing. There's a lot more to it than you would think. So we know the basic precipitation, evaporation, and condensation, uh, but there are definitely some other things that not many people know about the water cycle. For example, evapotranspiration is when plants uh, transpire, so they breathe out. Um, and that's going to put particles of water back into our water cycle. So, so some other characteristics of water that you might not know about is that solid ice is less dense than liquid water. So the reason that your ice is floating on top of your water is because it's less dense. And this is actually not very common. So usually when things are frozen, their molecules are packed more tightly together and make them more dense. But water is really unique in that the ice actually floats on top. And this is super important for our water ecosystem so that when the fish go down to the bottom of the lake during winter, the ice can stay up on the top and float at the top of the water instead of freezing from the bottom up. Some other really cool properties are surface tension. So that's kind of what we see over here with our water strider. So surface tension uh, in water is basically just depending on how light you are and if you have a very large surface area you can actually stand on water obviously we can't really as humans but we do have things like boats that allow us to float on water because of buoyancy um, but water striders use surface tension um, to stay on top of the water because the water molecules are actually able to stay tight enough together to hold up the water strider um, it's a universal solvent meaning that it can dissolve a lot of things uh, both in chemistry and also just in real life. Um, it has a really high viscosity and cohesion. So that means when you have a water droplet, you're going to see more droplets of water and uh, you can make larger droplets of water than usually other liquids. So its viscosity allows it to stick together as one droplet of water. And that's what cohesion means. That means the water droplets sticking together. It also has a high specific heat, which is really useful for chemistry terms and also electrically conduct, uh, conductive. So some other things about water is that when it comes to fresh and salt water, you might think, well, I know the oceans are big, but obviously we drink water, so there has to be a bunch of fresh water. Well, that's not actually the case. So if you see right here, we only have 3% fresh water in all of Earth's water. The rest of the 97% are our are, are oceans. Um, so that's going to be really interesting because if we look at that small 3%, so the tiny 3% up here, if we made it into 100%, um, we can see that only surface water, so our rivers and lakes, are 0.3% of that 3%. So that's a tiny amount of water compared to our oceans. And most of our fresh water is actually trapped in glaciers and ice caps. And then a lot of it is also in our groundwater, which we do use for drinking. Um, and then when it comes to surface freshwater, so of that 0.3%, it's mostly lakes and then swamps and rivers. So now we're moving on to wildlife. I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about macro versus micro. So we, maybe you've heard of microorganisms. Well, macroorganisms are also a thing. We just don't talk about it too much because it's pretty obvious. So some ideas for macro might be dog, uh, not house because it's not an organism, but it's technically, uh, if we're looking at scale, it would be big, so it's macro. Leaf, ant, rock. So these are things that might not be alive, but they are macro size. So some micro size things, so things that you can only see under a microscope, would be bacteria, viruses, amoeba, very small things that you can't see with your uh, human eye. And then some other interesting wildlife, um, looking more at plants and algae. So of course, when you guys go to the lake and it has green on the top of it, it's really mucky looking, that's going to be your algae. And these are photosynthetic eukaryotes. So I'm going to tell you really quickly what a eukaryote is. So that's a really big word. Uh, you guys will certainly learn it at some point in your high school career, hopefully. Um, but eukaryotic cells are, are basically the cells that we have. So we have 
um, normal animal cells. It can also be plant cells. All of them are eukaryotes because they have organelles. So if you heard of a nucleus before or a mitochondria, those are organelles in your cell. So prokaryotic cells do not have those specific organelles. So that's going to be our uh, bacteria and viruses. So these are going to be special cells that usually might have um, things on the outside of the cell wall, but don't have any really distinct organelles. So when we're thinking about eukaryotes, that's plants and animals, um, and that includes algae. So our algae plants are photosynthetic eukaryotes. And the reason that they're photosynthetic, I don't know if you guys have learned about photosynthesis yet, um, but chlorophyll are the cells that actually are able to uh, take light and turn it into energy for the plants. So moving on to algal blooms, I actually do a lot of research with this kind of stuff, um, but there's some really bad algal blooms with Lake Erie back in 2011 is where this picture was taken, but a few other times more recently, like 2014, 15, I believe, there are really bad algal blooms. And uh, actually the city of Toledo, Ohio, which gets its drinking water from Lake Erie, had to uh, shut down their drinking water for a few weeks because of the algal blooms. Because even though algae in itself might not be super, super toxic, there's bacteria in the algae that makes it undrinkable and could really get people sick and is actually a liver toxin. So talking about invertebrates. So I don't know if you guys have seen how they categorize wildlife of any kind, um, but the very top domain is going to be our broad category, our broad umbrella. And then as you go down, you're going to see, you get closer to species and that stuff. Um, I had to memorize that for biology, so you guys might be looking forward to that. So invertebrates are basically anything that doesn't have a spine. So if it's a life form and it doesn't have a spine, it's an invertebrate. So an example might be a snail, or it might be, uh, I, I think, arachnids, so spiders count as well because they don't actually have bones or spines. Um, and that's going to be our very beginning of life is invertebrates. And we're looking back at like 600 million years ago, so pretty, pretty far away. Um, and just really quickly, talking about morphology and phyla. So phyla is one of these categorizations that we use to distinguish what our uh, wildlife is. But to figure that out, you need to look at morphology. So morphology is going to be what this wildlife, uh, what its physical features are. So does it have four legs? Does it have a spine? That sort of thing. Um, and then when we're talking about invertebrates, there's a lot of really interesting things that you can see. Worms obviously are invertebrates and they have segmentation, meaning that they have different segments of their body. So you would have to write that down if you're trying to categorize certain wildlife, uh, especially that, those that have segmentation. Uh, also, we have appendages. So how many appendages does this have? Uh, does it have a million, like a millipede, or does it have like four? So another thing to look at is symmetry. So symmetry uh, is really important. We have pretty good symmetry. A lot of things do have symmetry. Um, but if you know a starfish, a starfish has five-way, depending on how many legs it has, um, five-way symmetry. So you could cut it in half to have symmetry that way, move 25 degrees, cut it in half, um, that sort of thing. So it's how, what, how symmetri symmetrical is our invertebrate? Cilia are, are special little legs that some very small invertebrates may have that let them float through water and that sort of thing. And then I want to look really closely at jellyfish. So this is really interesting. So it's called a Portuguese man of war. It's a type of jellyfish. And it's a colonial organism, meaning that even though you see Portuguese man of war, like that's an animal, it must just be one animal. It actually is a colony of animals put together. So here is a picture of a Portuguese man of war. So you can see that we have our crest or sail up top, but that is actually made up of a organism. So one organism makes up that crest at the top and that sail. So it's called a pneuma to four, which is a gas-filled float. And that's going to be actually one of our organisms. Another organism, which is multiple organisms, are the gonozoids. So that's going to be for rep reproduction, um, but there's also gastrozoids there as well, and that's for digestion. So all of these different words that you're seeing here are different organisms that make up this jellyfish. So that jellyfish is not one animal. It's actually a multi 
a multiplicity of different organisms within this one animal. So I'm not quite sure if there's other examples of colonial organisms, but I, I had never heard of that before. And I think it's really cool that the Portuguese man of war is actually made of different organisms. So looking at fish, there's a bunch of different fish. Um, since we're talking about aquatic biology, uh, ocean fish are very weird looking. You can see the angler fish at the top, uh, top, and then over to the right, you see the viper fish, and then a bristle mouth at the bottom. So these are just some weird looking fish that you can see at different depths in the ocean. But looking more towards our home base, so Michigan, um, these are some of the fish that I have uh, together. So I don't know if you guys go fishing at all or if you are near a lake or that sort of thing and you want to look at fish. Um, this is kind of a really good, like take a screenshot of it or something. Um, just some basic fish that you might see when you look into the water. And it's really nice when you can live somewhere, right, your whole life and actually say, hey, I know what kind of fish are in this lake because I've seen them and I can identify them. And that's part of biology and aquatic biology is identifying organisms and wildlife. So looking at mammals, so we went from invertebrates, looking at fish, now we're looking at mammals. So there's a bunch of different aquatic um, ocean mammals. You can see seabirds, so uh, for us maybe it would be like a gull, right, a seagull. Um, turtles, whales, dolphins, once again dolphins and whales are mammals even though they live and swim in the ocean, right, so they're not fish, they're mammals. Uh, seals, manatees, sea otters, these are all mammals that live in the ocean or near the ocean. And of course, polar bears, so that's more towards the Arctic region. Um, so now I'm going to look at the lard glove activity. So this activity is going to require you to have maybe Crisco, you guys probably have Crisco in your kitchen, or other lard based, it can be vegetable based as long as it's um, meant for like putting on pans, right? So usually it's going to look like this. Um, Crisco is what we have in my house. But then you use Crisco, you take either, if you have any of these fancy gloves or if you just have a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag that you can put your hand in, um, and then you're going to put it under icy water and you should be able to feel that the lard gives you insulation. Um, and that's going to be exactly what keeps little seals and whales and that sort of thing insulated in this really cold temperature, and that's that lard. So even on, um, on the continents, right, like not in the ocean or anything. Uh, polar bears have a lot of hair to keep them warm, but really when it comes to living in these really cold waters, lard is where it's at. So I'm going to show you in a second what that lard glove activity looks like and how to prepare it. Okay, so now I'm starting off with my icy water, which is in a pretty big tin, so that I have enough room to put my hand in it. And then I have plastic bag, which is just a sandwich bag, so that I can put my hand in it, and I have Crisco. So you guys can use whatever you want. This is actually vegetable based, so it might not work quite as well um, than your lard alternative, right, because lard is actual animal fat, um, which is used for insulation, but Crisco works pretty well as well. So I'm just going to take my clean baggie with my hand inside and just grab a bunch of it. So you can see I got my Crisco in my hand. I'm gonna squeeze it around. It's really gross. Be aware, this is a messy <laughs> demo. So I got my Crisco in my hand and I've already touched my water. It's really, really cold. Let's sit there for a while too if you do have your uh, ice in there. So I'm going to kind of put my Crisco all around my bag. So it's kind of looking like this now. I've also got Crisco all over my hand, whoops. <laughs> and I'm going to put it in the water. So the parts where the vegetable shortening or lard or Crisco or whatever you ended up having, the parts that are very heavy Crisco in my bag, or on my bag, I should say, I can't feel the cold. So I can feel it at the tips of my fingers over here, but near the palm of my hand, I can't feel it as much because there's a bunch of Crisco right there. And that's going to be what our lard animal fat does for these seals and whales as well. So I hope that was fun. I hope you guys can do it at home as well. It's a little messy, so be careful. All right, continuing on with wildlife. Just one more slide. Just wanna let you know that wildlife is super, super old, right? So there's 
this uh, fancy parastomus that is an early sea mammal. So looking back at all those mammals that are in the ocean, this is an early one from 40 million years ago. And then you have amber fossils as well. And then this is a nice site if you guys want to check it out sometime for the geological timeline. So it really shows you how evolution has brought us from the oceans back onto Earth, right, onto the continent. And then there's some other things that you guys can check out as well. The National Park Service uh, is very good at uh, teaching ocean habitats and that sort of thing. So moving on to oceanic zones. So these are going to be what you will find um, at dif different depths of the ocean. So the pelagic zone is going to be on top and that's where you can still find light. So light is um, of course used for algae and that sort of thing. Um, also any other, um, plants that you find in the ocean, but as you get further down depth-wise, I'm sure you've seen videos and stuff, but there are, there's no light, so there can't be any plants down there. And usually any fish that live in these aphotic, which means no light zones, um, they have to get things that drop from above, like dead fish that drop from above, and they have to feed off of that because there's no plants to feed off of, or feeding off each other, right? So the pelagic zone is going to be our very top then you see our intertidal zone and subtidal zone. So both of these are still photic. So they still have light filtering through the water and you haven't gone deep enough where there's so much water that the light can't get through. But as we get down to our bathyal and abyssal, we're definitely going aphotic. And then our hadal is going to be our very bottom. So once we hit the seafloor, that's our hadal zone. And all of these are aphotic, meaning no light. So looking more at our fresh water, um, if you guys have any microscopes or even if you have any magnifying glasses, uh, usually you can you just go to any weird pond you have or any still water um, and you find a bunch of really gross things in the water. Um, I would suggest that, I mean, it's pretty easy to see water striders and that sort of thing, but if you do know of a dirty pond, of course do not uh, drink the water wash your hands after you try to collect samples. But I would definitely suggest grabbing a cup and then uh, also maybe a, a thin dish so that you can pour a little water in. And you can uh, sort through the water and see some of these things like flatworms, scuds, water fleas, copepods, water scorpion, strider, nymphs, and larvae. So these are just some things that you might see either under a microscope or you might be able to see it with your naked eye. I know I have actually seen water scorpions before. They are insane and scary. Um, but these are just like some bugs like nymphs and larvae are actually the offspring of bugs. So it's before maybe a dragonfly becomes a dragonfly. It is in its larvae form. So some of these aren't actually just like water organisms. Some of them are bugs. <laughs> so it's like, oh, the bugs that are flying above me are also in the water? Gross. <laughs> so now looking at biodiversity and food webs. So food webs versus food chains, just to begin with, you guys might have learned more about food chains. Food chains aren't super realistic. You can see over here that a food chain just has going from the energy of the sun to producer, primary consumer, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary consumer and it's very linear and it only has a few organisms in it but the food web shows what actually happens in real life so obviously a shark does not just eat a small shark right a large shark does not always eat small sharks sometimes they eat marlins or lancet fish like there's a ton of things that they eat it's just like humans we don't just eat chicken right so food webs are more realistic looking but we still have these same terms of producer which is going to be what our algae are or anything that is taking from the sun to make energy. So algae and grass are only really having the sun and then soil, they're not really eating anything. And then you have primary, secondary, tertiary consumers. So primary is just saying those things that eat the producers. Um, so a cow might be an example of a primary consumer. Um, secondary consumer would be what is eating that thing that was eating the producers, right? So you can see it here, this secondary ocean sunfish is eating the copepod, which was the primary consumer, 
which was eating our producer. And then that's the same thing with the tertiary and as you go up. And then decomposers, which are going to be really useful once you get down to the uh, hadal level, the remember our zones of the ocean, um, over to those aphotic zones, so no light zones, decomposing is where it's at because they don't have enough light to have producers down there. So you can't really eat producers. You're going to have to decompose what's already down there. So of course there are fish that can swim down to these aphotic zones and then swim back up. Um, so they don't have to be decomposers eating dead things. But some of, one example of a decomposer in the ocean would be the sea cucumber. Um, and these, please look them up. They're pretty cute sometimes. Sometimes they look kind of gross. Um, but those just eat dead things, just like you would see a buzzard eating a dead thing on the side of the road. And then, of course, I hope you guys know prey versus predators. So our predator is going to be our consumer, which is going to eat the prey. Um, if, and, of course, prey can still be predators themselves, right? Just because a large shark is eating a fish and the fish is prey, it does not mean the fish doesn't have other prey that it eats as well. Um, and then keystone organisms are organisms that are really important to the food web. So um, there's some different examples of it, but really, basically, if you take something out of a food web and it's a keystone organism, the food web would collapse. So there would be a really big issue. So if everyone is eating the producer, but the producer dies off, that's a keystone organism because the food web would have a really, really big issue because everyone was eating it, right? So this is just a closer look at our food web. And we see that we have some of our um, micro-ish organisms that I told you that you could find in fresh water as well, like the copepods. Um, so this is going to be our producers down here. You can see it kind of segmented off. Producer, primary consumer, secondary, that sort of thing. All right, so now we're going to talk about climate change. Just to begin with, why is it so hotly debated? So you guys might have heard either maybe from your parents or just on the news, like, oh, like climate change is, there's, it's not completely true or it's not like made by people, that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of different opinions on climate change. And some of the reasons why it's so hotly debated is that it's a really big money issue. If you want to quote unquote solve climate change, you're going to have to fork up some money to make renewable energy or that sort of thing. Um, so that's going to require governments to shell money towards that kind of thing. And if, depending on your politics, um, you might see that as a waste of money. Um, and then globalism is another really big issue for climate change because as you've seen now, um, because of coronavirus, right? Globalism is a little bit shut down because we don't really have as many planes going to these other countries. Um, and all of these different globalistic things are making climate change kind of worse because every time you take an airplane ride, you are burning fossil fuels. Consumerism, which is basically just saying buying a bunch of stuff. So uh, we kind of live in a consumerist or capitalist um, society. So we buy a lot of things and sometimes we just waste those things. So when you go to the dollar store and you say, I'm going to get this cool toy, play with it for five seconds and throw it in the trash, that's definitely consumeristic. And that's contributing to climate change. But we really see it debated here because we don't want to stop buying stuff, but we also want to stop climate change. So it's kind of hard. And then, of course, politics, which I give a yikes on that one. <laughs> uh, politics is a big issue on climate change. I would say I'm not a political science major, so at, don't ask me. <laughs> So some other effects of climate change um, on the ocean specifically, it's coral be bleaching. So coral, cor coral bleaching occurs when um, the color goes out of the coral because it's dying. So when coral turns white, that's basically it's turned into chalk um, and it's dead. So it's unable to uh, support any life because the organisms that would hide in the coral um, no longer can stay there because the coral was giving um, food in some ways to those producers, primary consumers, um, and without the live coral, there cannot be any organisms living in there. So why does coral bleaching occur? It's basically just the acidification. So the ocean is getting more acidic. So you guys know acids, right? Like they burn things. This isn't going to say like, oh, if I touch the ocean, my hand's going to burn. But it does mean 
uh, bye bye to some coral reefs. And that's what coral bleaching is. Fish migration is another huge thing. So when you start to overfish an area, fish are going to migrate to other areas, but that's not always going to be possible um, because there's not going to always be enough there to support life uh, for the fish. And then drowning wetlands. That's kind of interesting because you think wetlands, they're supposed to be wet, right? Well, we're drowning them because oceans are rising. So those freshwater wetlands especially sometimes can have ocean water, so salt water, go into the wetland and create a really big problem. Um, and that will kill off whatever is in the wetlands. And I would definitely suggest, if you're interesting, interested, to look into wetlands like bogs and swamps. I absolutely love them. Um, I know in our area, Kalamazoo, there's a def definitely a bunch of bogs that you can go hike at. Just look it up. Um, I love hiking at bogs. But other than that, you can definitely see the life and biodiversity within the wetlands. So ocean acidification, I talked about that earlier. This is a chemical equation uh, formula as to what actually happens. So how is our oceans becoming more acidic? And it's because the CO2 in the atmosphere, um, so fossil fuels create CO2 and we have increased levels of CO2 in our atmosphere and our air. Um, but when the CO2 from that air comes into contact with the water or H2O of the oceans, it creates uh, hydrogen ions. So that's H plus right here. Hydrogen ions are what make things more acidic, just in general. But here it also means more acidic for the ocean. So that's how oceans become more acidic. And then this is going to be a positive feedback loop. So that means that um, a feedback loop generally is if you do something, especially if it's positive feedback loop, if you do something, it's going to be like dominoes. It's just going to make bigger and bigger problems and it's going to feed itself. So say if I plant a seed, this is a nice positive feedback loop. If I plant a seed, I don't have to plant another seed to make that grow. It'll grow on its own and keep on building and building on itself. And that's kind of how a lot of issues with climate change work in the oceans because a lot of these are intermingled. So I talked about fish migration, but coral bleaching also can cause fish migration. So that's a sort of positive feedback loop where something bad, coral bleaching, is leading to something else that's bad and just kind of builds on itself. So here's some more things. I actually took this from my, uh, one of my college classes, this graph here. And it's looking at what sectors are emitting those greenhouse gases. So that's our fossil fuel emissions, right? That create that CO2. That's such a big problem in our atmosphere. Um, so right here, you can see that transportation. So cars in 2017 for the United States is our highest percent greenhouse gas emission. And then you see electricity, and then industry is referring to any factories, that sort of thing. Commercial and residential, so that's our houses. And then agriculture. So some things that we do on a daily basis, depending on your work, is engineering efficiency in industry. So I'm an engineer. So what engineers are supposed to do are make more efficient ways to make things. So in industry, when you're making something, uh, if you make it more efficient, it saves the company money, which is great, but it also will use less product and have less waste, so less CO2 output. Um, some other things to look at is renewable energy. So I know Michigan State University, which is where I go to, has a new solar farm, which is great. So that's solar panels creating energy for the campus. And there's some debate on renewable energy because we, it's really hard to get enough batteries for it. Um, and sometimes the batteries take a lot to make. So it's like, well, is it worth it if the batteries are so bad for the environment to even make to have these solar energy farms and that sort of thing. So that's something that a lot of people have researched to determine their opinion on it. Um, and then electric cars, I'm sure you guys have seen Teslas. They're very cool looking, um, but electric cars are definitely something that's going to take down that transportation 29%. Um, but I will tell you that airplanes are much worse <laughs> than the car that you're driving. Um, but I don't know, it's very hard to try to stay conscience, conscious of uh, environmental needs. And then lastly, what's our human impact on the ocean? So we can talk all day about climate change and you're like, well, 
I mean, I guess CO2 probably goes into the atmosphere. I can't really see it. Like, I don't know. But these are definitely some very real things that you can see in the ocean that is human impact. It might not contribute to climate change, but it's certainly contributing to death in the oceans and freshwater as well. So dumping waste, plastic versus glass bottles. So you can see a lot of floating waste and it's going to be our plastic products. You're definitely going to want to try to use glass as much as possible, even though you might say, well, I recycle my plastic. The truth is it's very difficult to recycle plastic and glass and tin cans, that sort of thing are much easier to actually recycle. So even though you're like, well, but I put it in the recycling bin, whether they actually use that plastic or just throw it away kind of depends on how much they have to take in. But glass and tin are far easier and quicker to recycle. Um, and this is at the actual recycling facilities. So hopefully that waste will not be dumped in the ocean. Um, runoff. So some of the agricultural uh, issues, so our farms, when you put fertilizer on the fields, the runoff, so when water hits the fields and causes water to carry some of that fertilizer off the farm fields, they go into bodies of water, like lakes, like Lake Erie I showed you, and they create harmful algal blooms. So that's the, the algal blooms I showed you before, but they are harmful. So they, that means they probably have bacteria in it that could be toxic. Um, and they can definitely disrupt not only any drinking water, but they can also kill fish. So they really take up a lot of oxygen in the water. So the fish aren't able to breathe in the water, right? Because they fish need oxygen too. That's why they have their gills. Um, but there's not enough oxygen in the water because the algae is taking all of it up. So it kills fish in that water. And then of course overfishing, this happens in different areas of the world. It's basically humans like to eat fish, but we're such a huge population and we eat a lot more fish than we used to because we're, we are perhaps more um, money savvy now or, or something like that. And we're able to eat more fish, which means that we are overfishing spots of the ocean. And it's fine to fish areas as long as you give the environment and the ecosystem more time for the fish to come back. So it's just like cutting down a tree. If you cut down a tree and just leave it like that, that's not helping anyone. But if you cut down a tree and then plant a new tree, that's great. And it just takes time for that tree to come back. That's kind of the idea of fishing responsibly is to fish someplace. And really we're talking about industry fishing. So if you're kind of worried like, oh, I go fish at my pond. Like, am I killing all my fish there? It's like, no, it's mostly a uh, big industry. So like when you go to Myers and you buy a bag of fish, Whoever fished that fish is probably on a huge boat that gets hundreds and hundreds of fish a day. Um, so that's going to be where our overfishing comes in. It's not really a single person by person basis. It's the big industry fishers. And then hunting to extinction. So you guys have probably heard of like the American bison. So that was hunted to extinction a while ago uh, or close to extinction. Um, but some real things in the ocean are shark fin soup. So that's a big delicacy in Asia. And it's very expensive, but shark fin soup is basically taking these uh, fish and cutting off their fins and dumping the rest. So normally when you have a big fish, like a shark or that sort of thing, you take all the meat off and you're trying to use as much as possible from it. But since shark fin soup is so expensive and so sought after, um, sometimes they just cut off the fin and throw away the dead fish without even using the meat. So it's a huge waste and it's also causing people to hunt sharks and that sort of thing to extinction so that they can have these very expensive soups, which aren't great. <laughs> uh, but I would say for you guys, I hope this is useful with learning aquatic biology. I hope you're not mad at me for talking about climate change. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully you guys can think about the future and what you guys wanna be at, when you grow up and how you wanna help the environment. Thank you very much.